Father, we are so grateful to you for this time, Lord. Thank you very much for giving us another opportunity that we could come together and study your word and especially uh, learn about you. Lord, I pray your grace may be granted to us and your spirit's lead may be given to us for the next one hour time we spend uh, uh, in uh, pondering your scripture or your word, O oh Lord. But I pray that you may speak to us through your servant, open our hearts and minds that we may be able to receive and perceive the truth that you wanted to communicate with us, O oh Lord. Lead us and guide us and uh, throughout uh, the hour and our program, Lord, your name be exalted, the words of our mouth and meditations of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. So as mm -hmm. usual, we will have a 30 minutes of a teaching session and then we will keep it open for the forum. So I'll give it over to uh, Pastor. Thank you, Praveen. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, lovely that you could connect again. Uh, we are going to continue with what we started last week, and that is the sacraments. Uh, in case you have your uh, We Believe notes, it's uh, page 28 we are on. But let me do a little bit of a recap. Uh, as uh, even as we begin um, as i said we are studying the sacraments and uh, what are the sacraments it is the visible sign of the invisible grace that we receive from god uh, 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 what we really say is that a sacrament is an act of christian worship uh, uh, it is instituted by Christ. For example, baptism has been commanded by Christ. Go and baptize, he says in Matthew 28. So that is, we call a sacrament or uh, from a more from a Protestant background, it is probably better to call it an ordinance like uh, we explained last week. So another sacrament uh, is communion and these are the two sacraments that we have included in our you know worship calendar uh, these two are something that we uh, follow on a regular basis now the catholic church or the orthodox church some other churches may have many more in fact they have seven sacraments and they call it sacraments because they believe that divine life is being uh, trans transmitted through those sacraments. For example, uh, the Catholics tend to believe that if you partake of the communion, you're actually receiving or you're actually partaking of Christ's uh, literal body and blood and divine grace is being transmitted. Now, we look at it a little differently, which we explained last time. Um, there are also some churches that are non-sacramental, which means to say that they don't have any uh, sacraments. They don't uh, observe any sacraments. Uh, they they believe is just they don't need an outward ex expression of their of their inward spirituality. So they don't institute any sacraments. Like I said a little earlier. Uh, from a protestant perspective we call it an ordinance uh, we believe it is symbolic rather than the sacrament by itself having any inherent power for example baptism doesn't have an inherent power uh, but it's a visible sign of uh, an inward uh, you know expression of our belief all right um, we also discussed last time why do we do baptism only once while we take communion on a regular basis? Uh, the reason for that is Christ, for, as far as baptism is concerned, Jesus Christ died for us once and for all. And, uh, and we are united with him once and for all. And so we don't repeat that particular sacrament uh, again and again. So, uh, that is the reason why baptism is only once and our union with Christ is once. Uh, we are not disjointed from Christ at any time. 
of course we may not believe or we may we may go back on our belief but christ still remains you know uh, well in one sense you could say united with us but then if we separate then it is of course our problem now communion is done repeatedly uh, for some every day for some once a week or what we do is once a month the reason for that is it's an expression of a continual need for jesus christ our lord uh, we believe that we need to be ministered by the holy spirit and the power we we need to receive from the spirit and so we come to the table repeatedly and that's the reason why that is a, uh, a repeated uh, ordinance now let's uh, go into these two ordinances or sacraments if you'd like uh, whichever word we can use it interchangeably but i hope you understand the you know the very slight difference that might exist between the two uh, we are going to do just a brief study in the in, in future we might do a little bit more in depth study of each of these but today we will uh, stick with the book and go to you know a uh, 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 just a brief study of these uh, ordinances we are going to now go to the book and we we'll look at our notes and i'm going to begin at 8.5 the question uh, in 8.5 reads what is the meaning of baptism and then the answer is uh, reads as follows baptism is a sign and seal through which we are joined in union with christ it proclaims that we are saved by christ alone and not through our own repentance and faith it is a participation in the death and resurrection of jesus christ in which our old nature has been crucified and renounced in christ and we have been freed from the shackles of the past and given a renewed nature through his resurrection baptism proclaims the good news that it is only in christ that we receive the new life of repentance and faith grace communion international uh, typically baptizes adults by immersion and infants by sprinkling okay uh, that last uh, line will be a, just a little uh, shocking for a few of us who have come through the wcg you know uh, doctrinal position where we condemned you know the baptism of infants but we will discuss that in just a few moments let me pick up a few thoughts there baptism is basically a sign and a seal as it says uh, of what it, of what it is the fact that we have joined in union with christ we are now in union with christ what are we being united to of course the person of christ uh uh and symbolizing his death in his incarnation his death or that we are dying in him and then we are resurrected to a new life so that we can partake of the new nature that uh uh we are privileged to participate in so uh what does that sort of uh, uh, what does that portray what is the deep meaning that portrays and this is perhaps what is important the fact that we are in union with christ and that we are saved by christ alone right it is not by anything that we have done or can do it is not even the repentance uh, or the faith that we uh, repose uh, it is christ's you know uh, shed blood his humanity in the incarnation and his shed blood and as a resurrection and finally his ascension that brings the reality of the new life in us all we are doing is accepting what christ has done for us and baptism is or, or rather pictures that baptism is a sign and a seal of that right once again uh, it says only in christ we receive this new life of repentance and faith uh so christ is exclusive in the sense that 
it is only in him we have access to uh, repentance and faith and the new life that we can uh, enjoy. But when I say Christ is exclusive, I must also say Christ is inclusive in the sense that in Christ, all of humanity has been included, right? In his baptism, he was baptized for all of humanity. And so in that respect, we are, uh, you know, Christ is inclusive. Uh, 8.6, the question reads, at what age should a person be baptized? The answer reads, for infants and children, it is parents' choice and some prefer to ask for a blessing to be prayed for the infant and leave the choice of baptism to the child as he or she matures to, the older, to an older age. Is it appropriate to baptize infants? Yes, baptism is a sign of God's promise that an infant is embraced into the covenant community of the body of Christ, which is the church. Those who in repentance and faith present infants to be baptized vow to raise them in the knowledge and fear of the Lord with the expectation that the child will one day profess Christian faith as their own. The professional faith is then normal, so personal faith is then normally demonstrated at a service of confirmation when, as discerned by the elders of the congregation, the child uh, reaches a personal awareness in which a testimony of the faith in Christ is shared. And the example given is Acts chapter 2, verse 39. So it is about infant baptism. And uh, the GCI says uh, infant baptism is uh, uh, accepted. It is not, uh, it doesn't look like it is encouraging, but it, uh, GCI accepts it. Uh, but a person requires a personal conviction of their faith. So I would like to keep it open for your thoughts. Definitely it is a difficult subject so that we can uh, discuss about it. Yes, yeah, actually, um, uh, any act has to be relational, mm. uh, I believe, uh, uh, because unless there is a communication, uh, we would not be able to share the understanding. So uh, in that context, I believe uh, infant baptism would not really be viable, because it would be like... Uh, someone is kind of forcing that person and uh, we do not know what is the plan of the God as he or she matures and comes to an understanding uh, into uh, knowing at least a basic understanding about good and bad and what is. So um, I believe uh, I'm not talking like uh, he or she should be theologian to be, become baptized. But yes, a, a general understanding about who Christ is and who I am. I mean, there are certain things which has to be known. So building up the relationship with the Lord and then getting baptized because baptism is something very quintessential where uh, it uh, represents that uh, we are washed and we have come up as a new creation in the sense of symbolically. So uh, it's a very important event in a person's life, right? It's, it's something, uh, you see, when we talk about Christ and a person, it is something very personal, and it has to be relational, and both have to uh, be able to understand. So obviously, I believe <clears throat> I would uh, uh, definitely not, uh, uh, I'm not in the favor of infant baptism in that sense. Um, I hope uh, I'm making some sense out there. And... Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, th there is, uh, I mean, even if you see scientifically, even in a, in a scientific uh, world, it says uh, a child will come to a, a state of reasoning after a certain age. So again, uh, what is that certain age is again flexible with different scientific uh, perspectives. So we can keep that as open. But surely an infant would not have that uh, capacity or, you know, incapacitation of uh, understanding uh, or the insight of communicating. 
I mean, this is my understanding, and if anyone has any deviation, they are welcome to, you know, have uh, share their. That's what I would like to share. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Okay, so you are saying that infant would not be in a position to discern, uh, and then have to have a conviction. Uh, yes, exactly. And can have a commitment towards Christ to be in relationship. He hardly yes. able to understand. That's the reason uh, uh, the baptism does not make uh, any sense. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. it may not be significantly uh, applicable. That's why. Okay. So, any other thoughts? Uh, can you hear me, Pramit? Yes, Uncle, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, this time, actually, Bible also says, "Repent and be baptized." And child cannot uh, repent. He Child is not grown up to that extent, I feel. Yeah. So, are you trying to comment? Because of... Uh, yeah, I understand. Nelson, mm -hmm. you want to say something regarding that? We are not able to hear you. Uh, Nelson, Anna, would you like to say something about it? Yeah, definitely. As parents, we would like our child to be blessed. Yes. But any child, as a matter of fact, as parents, would like to dedicate the child, ask for God's blessing on the infant. But as the child grows, they come to an understanding of God. Sometimes it may vary between 8 and 18 before they get into the adult stage. Sometimes they accept God at a very early age and they dedicate themselves, yes, I will follow in a child's mind. Yes, in that case, I say it is very much appropriate to baptize because it not only encourages the child but also affirms the faith that they have in Jesus Christ. They come to an understanding, yes, my ways are not right. I cannot do anything. But it's only through God, Jesus Christ, that I am reconciled to God. So, what is the right age? As infants, definitely we need a blessing. But when they come to an understanding, yes, I would definitely agree to the point that, you know, when a child is willing to dedicate herself or himself, then we should encourage them to be baptized. In case of Nathan, he in the second or third week of his birth. And it happened in the church. He was blessed in the congregation. But he was not baptized. Yeah, those are interesting thoughts. I do have a couple of thoughts to share regarding this. Number one is uh, giving baptism to infants. It is it is not uh, a new practice. Actually, it was in the ancient traditions. In not only in Christianity, it was in Jewish tradition. It was in other religions also. So when the uh, when the newborn baby comes, so even Jesus was brought to the temple on the eighth day for circumcision. So that was that was also uh, a movement. I don't think that at the age of eight days a person would be able to understand what is circumcision. Why these people were circumcised because God, come, come, we all know the story, why God uh, com commanded or ordained the children of Israel to be circumcised at eighth day only, particularly on the eighth day only. Okay, we, uh, that is about a uh, you know covenant God made with Abraham. I don't think that eight, eight days old child would be able to understand, but that does not uh, mean if a child can be negated from the covenant that God makes. So, the, because of that reason, the eighth day circumcision was hap uh, happened. That's one of the examples I'm bringing to uh, your notice. I'm not saying that circumcision and baptism are the same. So, but these kind of traditions were already uh, there in the ancient religions. And even in the uh, Bible also, we can find those. And second thing is, when the child was brought to the priest, even the modern day, I, I came from an Anglican background. I was baptized as a child. And I have seen uh, 
my sisters and my brother's children were being baptized. When the children were brought for baptism, they were uh, parents were not asked uh, whether the child believes in Jesus or they don't ask whether the child believe child believed and repented, confessed his sins and uh, baptized in Jesus. Uh, I mean, uh, accept Jesus as their Lord. And what are the classic uh, baptismal questions that a priest asks uh, people? So the, none of these things have happened. So but what I personally feel is the baptism in the modern day, which was given to the infants, it is more of dedication. Dedicating a child. That is the reason okay. as the children grow they, give, they have confirmation. Since uh, so till they take confirmation, they get confirmation, they are not asked to partake uh, in the communion. So in the modern, many other churches, they say only people who are baptized can partake in the communion. Even in the uh, liturgical churches who are giving baptisms to infants, they are not allowed to partake in the communion uh, till they confirm and confess their personal faith in Jesus Christ. So perhaps maybe the child, we are calling it sprinkling thing baptism. Perhaps we should consider, we should take it as a, uh, we should take it as a dedication. It is because the questions asked were not about baptism. The questions were asked were not about confirmation. The questions were asked were not about uh, their faith in Jesus Christ. The questions were asked to the parents to raise the child according to the teachings and uh, <coughs> according to the instructions that the Lord has given. So we cannot totally neglect, we cannot negate a child being part of, uh, you know, the covenant God makes or come is something that God involves people into it. So Jesus says, uh, let the little children come to me and the kingdom of God belongs to the such as uh, the little children, right? So when Jesus invites them into kingdom, we also need to realize that they are, elib they are eligible for the kingdom. And I really don't think that as elders, uh, we to the moment we put our faith, we had all kinds of understanding about God. See, the kind of understanding we have today, do you really think that you have the same conviction and understanding the day you were baptized? In my case, it was not. So growth is a process. So where it starts, that doesn't matter. It's all about whether it is growing or not. It is continuing or not. That's what we need to realize. So what I would like to say is when it comes to child baptism, the better language, we can use it as dedication because the questions are all asked where about dedication. And we, no age can restrict anybody to be part of the kingdom of God or covenant of God or anything that God does in order to include us. So God, uh, God uh, enabled and uh, approved everyone. So whom God, and in fact, in one particular place, God, Jesus says, uh, whoever offends any of these children to enter into the kingdom of God, it is better for, him, for the person to be thrown into the sea with a heavy, heavy stuff hanged onto the neck. Okay, so definitely though sprinkling baptism, child, child is being baptized, we are calling the dedication, you call it. Later point, they are coming to the confirmation, this part, these things are there. So we don't need to be very critical on those things and uh, we don't need to be judgmental on those stuff. So I guess we should uh, keep it open. Because the child thing is dedication and conviction is yes, confirmation is anyway it is there. That's my just opinion. Yes, David. I would uh, take back to the scripture. Uh, uh, of course, as you were talking about the child uh, dedication, the best example is uh, Samuel and Hannah. I mean, after uh, a godly mother, if you will, she dedicated her child in uh, infant age at a very very young age uh, we i exactly don't know the age of of the of samuel but but surely uh, actually a mother was uh, so passionate that uh, samuel should become a servant of god so i believe that relationship also god accepts i mean as as you said the parents also uh, have to give the 
uh, affirmation about child's behavior, which I believe uh, it's a bond actually again, because uh, the, the union of uh, God is a family union. God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they, they work as a unit, as a family too. And, uh, and that's one of the examples I just remembered, it, it went into my mind. Uh, what a beautiful illustration that uh, uh, Anna, after so many years, she might have, uh, she might have wept, she might have really uh, asked the Lord as a gift, and she dedicated that her, her child, or her one child, Samuel, unto the service of the Lord, and God accepted it, and he became a great prophet. Definitely, that's a very good example. And one more, one of the biggest examples we can take from the Bible is also uh, is about Nazarenes. Uh, yeah. We know about Samson. Samson is one among them. So when right. Samson becomes a Nazarene, God uh, God speaks to his parents. He, this person is going to be Nazarene. He should not be drinking wine, and you should not cut his uh, cut their head. So what we see there, some kind of instructions right. to bring a child according to the instructions of the Lord. That was a commitment given to the parents and the instructions given to the parents and parents are committed to that and they brought forth to Samson that way. So this is also similar to those. So we don't need to be very critical on this stuff. That's what I would like to say. So since anyway, since Pastor joined us, I would like to let you let him know that we have discussed about the second point that's about uh, infant baptism and uh, we just shared some thoughts. Perhaps you can take it over from there. Okay, now can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, right. Now I'm on my cell phone. And this is the first time I'm doing this on a, on a cell phone. So uh, let me, uh, you know, I'm not sure if there'll be some glitches again. But yes, uh, you finished with 8.6, right, Praveen? You've discussed uh, 8.6. Uh, Praveen, I can't hear you. Yes, we discussed 8.6. 8.6 about infant baptism. Perhaps you can share your thoughts on that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, let me just share some thoughts on the infant baptism. Uh, in the past, our uh, fellowship, we did not believe in uh, 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 infant baptism because we... Uh, we always said that it has to be an adult baptism. It has to be by immersion. And uh, so we do not accept sprinkling or we do not recognize that. But through our affirmation, we have come to understand that, you know, infant baptism uh, as such, it may not necessarily be wrong. Let me just look at some scriptures. I will uh, read Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And I'm giving you some reasons as to why we uh, sort of don't necessarily say it is wrong. Uh, it may be permissible, but then I'll also give you our uh, perspective, our GCI perspective. But let me just give you what the Bible says. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. It's a... a, a something that we have used many a times. It says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But notice verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Uh, I must say that children are included in the promise even though it does not explicitly mention that children uh, can repent and be baptized. Obviously, that will come at a later time. But there is no, uh, there is there an inclusion of the children in that promise. That is something we need to keep in mind. Romans chapter 7 and verse 14 uh, talks about children of believers or believing parents. It says... Uh, uh, in 7 and verse 14. This is Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Um, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Oh, sorry. Um, it's not Romans. I'm sorry. It is 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <laughs> I made a mistake in the book. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 
and verse 14. Uh, it says, um, for the unbelieving husband uh, has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, it says, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. One Notice once again, children of believing parents, once again, are holy because of their belief in Jesus. In other words, there is an inclusion of the children or of the believing household. So, uh, we include the children, you know, in the community of the church and, of course, in all the aspects of church life. Uh, we know that in Jesus, all humanity is baptized. Jesus was baptized for all humanity. And obviously, children are included in that. Um, so, baptism is meaningful and significant for us only because of Christ. Uh, not because of the ritual by itself. So, what we have come to conclude is that the parents, the believing parents who are showing their faith in Jesus may ask for their child also to be baptized just as a sign of inclusion within the household of uh, the faith, right? Uh, and we may, we, we, we believe we must honor that. Now, it is not mandatory for children to be baptized. But if the believing parents come and ask for, you know, a baptism or ritual of baptism for their child, then uh, we are not against that. We believe that the Bible doesn't expressly exclude that or uh, say it is wrong. That's the reason why uh, we accept children's, uh, ch an infant's baptism. But we do believe that the child must grow up in the faith and finally, either through a confirmation or, uh, you know, to some public expression that they express their faith uh, in Jesus Christ. Now, my own personal belief is that we, I would prefer that, uh, that a blessing of the children be done. Now, we do laying on of hands. Uh, we, we have done it many times in our fellowship. Uh, the blessing of the children is something that I would recommend. My own children uh, were blessed and my own children were baptized when they were adults, as they chose. I did not force them to be baptized as children. But, uh, uh, but GC, in GCI, if a parent comes and says that I would like the baptism, we do not prohibit that. Let me uh, just check with you if you have any thoughts on that. Any questions? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, Mr. Rao, tell me. I mean, uh, if your uh, if parent comes and uh, asks for a child baptism, yes, how will you give the baptism? Sprinkling or immersion? Uh, we don't want the child to suffocate. <laughs> so, and we have to use water, which is symbolic. So obviously the best would be something like a sprinkling. Now, actually, I was going to show you a video of one particular Orthodox church, <laughs> the way they do infant baptism, but unfortunately I can't access that. It's in the computer. Uh, so frankly speaking, this is new to me. Uh, I have not done uh, an infant baptism so far. I have done blessings. Uh, I have laid my hands on children and blessed them. But I'm presuming that the best way, the safest way to do it is through sprinkling. For a child. But yeah, for a child. For yeah. a child. Uh, so, the, um, repent and bap baptize. Yes. That's not happening for the child. Right. That is correct. Um, but Bible says that. Yes, it does. So I think we are, are we not compromising with some of the 
basic things. Uh, it doesn't necessarily say that, uh, you know, I mean. I am not against blessing of the child. Right. The parent comes and asks for blessing or confirmation, something I don't know what is confirmation actually. Uh, that is okay. But asking child to be baptized, I don't know. I'm not comfortable to be frank. Yeah, I'm also, I'm also maybe, you know, to some extent not comfortable. But I don't see anything that uh, is, uh, what do you say, uh, is against the Bible. Uh, the child is already, you know, within the baptism of Jesus Christ. So perhaps we are only honoring the faith of the parent in that respect. Okay, the child is already included as the two scriptures mentioned. So uh, once again, it is symbolic. Mm. Yeah, I mean, in Christ, everybody is included. I accept that. That's right. So that uh, when question comes for baptism, I am little not con I mean, not comfortable. Uh, well, once again, like I said, uh, we are only honoring the parents' belief or, or faith. If the parent wants it that way, uh, you know, we don't mind obliging or honoring the faith of the parent. That is all we are saying. I'm doubting whether it is a biblical or not. Uh, well, so if you... If you I think some of the basics of the Bible. Yeah, what you, may, what you probably mean is that uh, since a child cannot repent, yes. he should not be baptized? Is that what you mean? Yeah, that is what Bible says, isn't okay. it? Okay, that is, that is a literal reading of the Bible. Hmm. But... Can we uh, also look beyond that and see uh, what the Bible may not necessarily prohibit? It does not prohibit, it does not say children should not be baptized. Of course, it didn't say that. Yeah. So, once again, there is a silence within the Bible, uh, which where we can take some, you know, liberty to decide what to do. Okay. That is all uh, I can say. Can I Any? add a thought? I'll definitely, I will, uh, I will. Can I do that? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it is regarding Sanjay Rao's thing, but I'll do since uh, David and Nelson are waiting. Perhaps yeah. once they speak, and I would like to come in. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, a child's heart is uh, more purer than an adult's heart. Certainly, I accept it. Jesus says that unless you become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of God. When you take that into the context, uh, no, no, no. You, you have to have a childlike attitude in yes. things. Yes. Where, you know, that purity is there within the child. To that extent, yes, a child does believe. They, I've seen children who are about four or five years, they have such a good faith in God. You know, they express in their deeds by praying and learning about God. God has accepted. It, it doesn't deny them from being blessed and being baptized. No. It, maybe it is like a start from where they take the tiny steps to grow. That's what I like to say. But as you said, sir, there should be a manifestation at a later stage where yeah. they agree, repent, and be baptized. That's right. Okay. See, uh, purity of heart is very much important, whether adult or child. God accepts that. I'm not denying that. Okay, but since Bible tells repent and baptize, and child cannot repent because he has not grown to that, that understanding. So, why don't you wait for the child to grow up and uh, if he's really interested in God, you can definitely give baptism. Uh, I feel that way. Anyway, uh, what pastor says, accepted. But I got my own... Uh, uh, understanding about 
and GCI uh, allows both. So there is no problem with that. If that is how you accept, that's that's not a problem at all. Uh, did David or Praveen had a thought? Let, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Let yeah, go. actually, um, in this context, uh, I was just uh, remembering about covenant theology. What does the covenant theology say on this aspect? Or is it, I mean, covenant is actually family uh, covenant. We have a concept of family covenant, divine covenant. There are different types of covenant theology. So if we look into the perspective of covenant theology, uh, how, what is the uh, justification on the infant baptism uh, concept in covenant theology? Because it just came into my mind, so I just wanted to ask a question on that aspect. Uh, Praveen, you want to take that? or? Uh... Yeah, regarding the covenant theology, perhaps we can deal while we are the studying about uh, uh, soteriology, about salvation and the other stuff. Uh, perhaps uh, we better discuss about uh, baptism. Would that be okay, David? Definitely, we'll come back to that. Right, right. Study yeah, about yeah. covenants and all. Uh, there are, uh, you know, we have to come to that. But regarding okay. baptism, especially, I would like to take the questions and the points brought by uh, Sanjeev Rao and uh, also David. Uh, in the Bible, it is written, "Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins." That is, uh, uh, mostly you'll find. Uh, especially very strong statements in Book of Acts. There are eight preachings in Book of Acts, eight gospel preachings, preached by both Peter and as well as Paul. And most of the times we, we take the uh, preachings and those statements very literally and we don't interpret them in the context. Okay. If you read these gospels, sorry, if you read these uh, uh, sermons by these two gentlemen, Peter and Paul, Peter was preaching to the Jewish community and Paul was preaching to the Gentile community. If you read both of their messages, both are different. When it comes to Peter, he strongly, repeatedly, he said the word, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And John also used that, you know. But when uh, Paul goes, if anywhere he preached, nowhere he tells them, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Only Peter says that, 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 that tells us he's speaking in a very particular uh, context, actually. Peter's gospel is fulfillment of the prophecies. Paul's gospel is revelation of mystery. I'm bringing to, so it may sound a little heavy for you, but uh, I would like to ask you to look at the statements. Peter's gospel is fulfillment of the prophecy. In Old Testament, there were so many prophecies, they were being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That is a message of Peter. And Paul's gospel is revealing of mystery. Mystery which was hidden from ages to ages, now it is revealed to holy apostles. And that's what Apostle Paul was preaching. So Peter, when he preached, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sin, he is talking about the Jewish community who explicitly rejected Jesus, who explicitly rejected the teaching of the Lord, and who explicitly involved in the murder of Jesus Christ. That's what you'll find only this statement could be found only in Peter's preaching, but not in Paul's preaching. Paul was preaching and going and telling people, you people are unaware of your father, who is not away from you, who is not a, a carved image, but who is always available with you. He is your father. Example is Acts chapter 17. That's a great preaching by Apostle Paul. That's what he was preaching. When Peter preached, he preached Jewish community who constantly rejected God's revelation in Jesus Christ and Jesus as the Messiah. So this message was for them. And second thing, that does not mean I'm negating uh, the Gentiles or non-Jewish people to repent. No, we all repent. Repent is change of our mind. Okay, Jewish people have to change their mind from rejecting Jesus. We people to change our minds looking under Jesus. You know, we were not looking for any other Messiah. We are looking, you know, we have to come to Jesus. And the message is we are accepted. That's what we are going to learn. We are changing our mind from being, we feel we are rejected. Now we accept that we are accepted in Jesus. That is our repentance. 
for Jewish people, it was different. They rejected the prophecies. They rejected the Messiah. So now they change their mind to accept Jesus as the Messiah. That is their repentance, actually. So this word has been spoken in that. That is one point. And second point I would like to bring before you regarding the repentance. Repent and believe for the remission of your sin. Acts chapter 2 verse 38, Apostle Peter said that word repent, it is the present continuous tense. It will never end. Okay. The repenting, okay. repenting thing will never end. It continues till yeah. we die. So there will be no point where we will be completely repented. Now that is one. Number two, we already said if you take those statements only very very <coughs> aggressively, we have to repent and baptize. Then only we'll be saved. So there are two different things should be happen. Baptism becomes necessary for our salvation. But it is not true. When we read the other scripture, we understand baptism is not necessary for our salvation. It is a sign of our salvation. We are saved. We are proclaiming it out through an outward action. Symbolic. Symbolic. Okay. So there is a difference in these statements. So we don't need to uh, hang on to these words, repent and be baptized, then only you will be saved. Uh, literally, we cannot take. In fact, if we read in the context, these words are spoken to Jews, number one. And number two, this repentance is a process. It continues forever. And number three, baptism is not something it is saving. It is just a sign. So I guess uh, I made few comments uh, concerning uh, the questions you have asked. Does it make, uh, is that okay, Pastor? Um, yes, uh, yeah, it, that is the broader perspective of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the aspect of repentance and baptism, like you said, um, we become, I mean, uh, <laughs> we talk about legalism. Uh, uh, sometimes we can be so, become so legalist that uh, suppose you are baptized before you repent. <laughs> Does, will it work? Like you said, uh, Praveen. You repentance is an ongoing process, right? So, in other words, you get baptized, but then you have to repent again. So, uh, trying to become too legalistic, I think, uh, is not necessary. <laughs> it's not necessary, I feel. I would like to encourage uh, whoever takes this very strongly. As I said previously, introduced the Gospel of Peter and Paul. Okay. And read it clearly, their, their preachings. You'll find the difference, actually. Read it in the context. I'll, I'll be available for you for any, uh, any questions in those regards. Yes, Angul. See, the repentance in, a both, in both ways, I mean, what Peter said, what Paul said, in both the cases, repentance is necessary. They may repent because they did not believe in in God in Old Testament. Hmm. Okay, but now we were not knowing Christ before. Now by preaching, people accept and repent and take and take baptism. Both both the ways repentance is required. Hmm. And as you said. Uh, Process continues because we may fall, we may sin even after baptism. And repentance is then also it is required. Even though Christ, uh, he took our sins um, permanently mm. and we are in Christ, we have that forgiveness. But still we repent and ask forgiveness. Is it uh, not necessary? Yeah, uncle, we read the statement, repent and believe, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sin. This is not an order actually. Repentance is number one. Baptism is number two. This is not an order actually. These mm. are two, two, two things Peter is introducing to the people. Mm. This, is not in, this is not an order. Mm. That's why I said the word repentance is a present continuous in its uh, original text, which means it continues. I think so it is not in, we should not take it as an order. First, repentance comes. One you done, once you done that, then you go for baptism. It is not like that. Yeah, I think uh, I think I am obstructing uh, the continuous of uh, preaching. 
we can discuss this later so let us continue with the uh, study okay uh, you hear yeah, me we are, more, we are more or less come to the end uh, time is up unfortunately uh, this break uh, sort of disturbed the whole flow but uh, let me just end by i mean like uh, uh, by what jesus said once again we have see this uh, legalistic way of doing it uh, is not is again a problem uh, for example when you say peter said repent and be baptized now what does jesus say in matthew 28 jesus says therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and then teaching them to obey everything i have commanded you so if you put if you once again if you take a literalist view it becomes again a bit difficult uh, there is it's not necessary for us to take a literalist view what we understand is that uh jesus in his humanity has included all of, all of us right. and the word and he said repent and believe the gospel the word repentance or repent in greek is metanoia which means change your mind in other words accept the new reality that jesus has come and now he has included all of humanity into himself believe in the new reality that is what basically it means now of course uh, we only put repentance to sin uh no repentance is much larger so let us just keep those things in mind once again uh there are so many unanswered issues that the, that that there might be but uh if we become too legalistic then we can get into uh, difficulty any other final thoughts and then we can end with a prayer it seems david want to wants to share yes david yeah i was just going to quote uh, a verse from uh, matthew chapter 4 verses 13 to 15 this is a personal uh, uh, act of baptism by jesus himself uh so just wanted to uh, uh, request you to explain about the verse 15th verse especially uh, which is very quintessential uh, about baptism of christ because uh, uh he is he confirms that it is for the fulfillment of all righteousness would you please repeat so, the verse matthew 4 you said yeah that's right matthew chapter 4 and verse 15 verse is 15 but it starts from 13 to 15 actually but 15 is the uh, answer by by the lord about why uh john the baptist had to give the baptism to the lord Uh, so, i think not matthew uh, uh, matthew 4:15 says land of zebulun and land of naphtali i'm not sure if that is what you 14, mean verse 14 uh, yeah see uh, matthew chapter 4 4 it is matthew chapter 4 verses 13 to 15 i, I have the bible in front of me <laughs> just checking leaving out. nazareth leaving nazareth he went and lived in capernaum which was by the lake in the area of zebulun and naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet isaiah is that correct okay, okay i think there's a problem with the text or something no it's not the problem matthew 4 oh, i'm sorry i'm sorry it's not matthew 4 i have done the same mistake as you have it's misquote it's matthew 3 sorry matthew 3 13 through 15 I... okay i'll tell you what uh, david will uh, uh, since time is up now we yeah. will let's take this up uh next time is that okay yeah yeah sure no problem no problem yeah because uh, i didn't want to uh you know let people keep waiting for the okay study to end so we'll take up that if you can just send that as a as a text, text. okay yeah. sure i'll do that what's that yeah. text to me and then we will work on that sure sure thank you thank you pastor i appreciate great anyway yeah. thanks very much for joining in and uh I'm uh, this is the first time I'm experiencing this problem I have to be ready when we have these breaks in internet let's uh, close with a prayer then and may I request uh, anand if you can just uh, close in prayer 
Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before your majestic throne, O Lord, and we thank you for this Bible study that you have blessed us with this evening. Lord, uh, we thank you for the discussions that have taken place and the questions raised. Uh, for some, the doubts have been erased. For some, the doubts have cropped up. Yes, Lord, you are the one who gives us salvation. You are the one who forgives us. So we submit our lives to you and we ask you to please direct us, lead us and guide us, O Lord, and bless us with your spirit. And be with us, O Lord, throughout this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.